All right, you guys can give it up for Joe and Sammy and the Athens Church Plant team. Wow, isn't that cool just to think? I mean, I love how Joe said, you might be asking, how are we planting a church in this crazy year? We wonder that too. And uh, we, we kind of feel like, wow, God's grace is just poured over this church in so many ways, and we're so thankful to be a uh, part of that, and we want you to know that you are part of that. If you are so- somehow connected here to H2O, you are going to be part of this church plant one way or another, because that's what we do here at H2O. It may not mean that you go, but it, it'll mean that you get the opportunity to pray. It'll get the opportunity to, to send people out. You'll get the opportunity to fill holes that are left here, and uh, for you, those of you who are newer to our church and haven't been part of one of our church plants, Uh, What an amazing season it is to be a part of. We're looking to send this team out in the next four to five months, so you'll be hearing a lot more about that uh, in the months to come. But really, our our vision here at H2O is to to have an H2O on every major college town in Ohio, and Athens is one of the very few places that we haven't got to yet. You can see our banners up here. If you're here, if you're joining us online, you can check out our website and see all the different H2Os we've been able to plant in the last 10 years, and it is truly a privilege to take the gospel to places that desperately need it. And we're inspired by the faith of the men and women that are starting to prepare to go and to plant a new church. We are excited today to celebrate. Today is kind of a a celebration Sunday in a lot of ways. We're talking a little bit about the church plant. We're going to be celebrating baptisms here in a few minutes. And really, we're just celebrating what God is doing uh, this year and in this season at H2O. And and I don't know about you. We we could talk, and we've talked at nauseam. I'm sure you've conversations about the craziness of 2020, but for me, it's so refreshing to stop and just be reminded that God is in control, that God is working, that there are powerful things happening, and we get to the privilege to partner with him. And, 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 and for me, like the crazier the world is around us, the more it makes me want to invest in things that actually matter. I don't know if, you, if that resonates with you or not, but that's what I've been reflecting on throughout this season recently. And many of our staff and our leaders, we've been reflecting on uh, the craziness in the world shouldn't stop us. It should actually draw us to want to invest in something that truly matters. None of us like spending time on things that don't matter, do we? None of us like wasting our time. And maybe you've been in a situation before where you've done that before. It could be something small. Maybe you're a student and you pulled an all-nighter. This happened to me when I was in college. You pulled an all all nighter. You stay up all night cramming for an exam. You show up the next morning and the professor, out of the goodness of their hearts, they push the exam back. And you're like, I just pulled an all nighter for this exam. I, it didn't matter that I studied this much time. I could have waited and done that later. Or maybe like you have a, a house and you want to paint a room. Uh, we, we haven't completely done this, but we've had friends have done this. They paint a whole room. And as soon as they get done, they look at it and they go, ah, eh, I don't like that. You know? And they realize I just wasted all all this time and they have to paint it a different color or maybe you get all dressed up to go out somewhere. You spend a bunch of time doing your hair. I know I have this problem all the time and uh, and you, you get, you know, perfect. You put on all your makeup, whatever the case may be and then your plans get canceled and you're like, I just wasted all this time. I don't know why. We, we don't like to do things that don't matter in life and, and there's a, a bigger picture to that as well, isn't there? And I think during seasons like this, we should all reflect not just on the little moments of our time of what matters most, but we should reflect even more so on what are we giving our lives to. What are we investing our hearts in? What are we investing our resources in? What are we investing our prayers in and our energy in? What are we giving our lives to? Francis Chan, he he shares this quote. He says, our greatest fear should not be of failure but of succeeding at the things in life that don't really matter. Think about that for a minute. Our greatest fear shouldn't be at failing at something that actually does matter. Our greatest fear in life should be at succeeding in the things that actually don't really make a difference. And I think for many of us that resonates. Some of us, we are afraid to take a risk for God because we're afraid at failing. Some of us are thinking, I can never step out in faith and do something for God because what if I do something wrong? Or what if the plan doesn't happen the way that I think it should? Or what if God doesn't come through in the way that I think he should? And so some of us, we never step out in faith because we're afraid. And yet here this quote reminds us, listen, that's not failure. Taking a risk for God is never a failure. What is actually a failure in the end is succeeding at something that in the end, when we look back on our lives, we say, I spent so much time 
and so much energy and so much of my heart on something that truly doesn't have an eternal impact, that isn't actually going to matter years and years down the road. So what really matters in life? See, our big idea is this, is we're just spending a few minutes before we jump into hearing the stories of baptism today. Our big idea is this, nothing matters more than finding and following Jesus. Nothing in life matters more than finding and following Jesus. Our, our mission here at HO is about inviting people to find and follow Jesus together. And so there is nothing that is more important than that. And I want to just look at a couple of quick passages uh, during this kind of devotional here this morning where Jesus is asked similar questions. Jesus is kind of put on the spot, and he, he, he's essentially asked this question, if you can boil it down, Jesus, what really matters in life? And I want to look at Matthew chapter 22. Uh, and this is a passage where, where Jesus was developing his ministry, and a lot of people were trying to trick him and catch him and giving the wrong answer. And so you have to know the little bit of the context as we open up this passage. It wasn't like people were coming to Jesus and they actually wanted to know what his answer was because they were, they, they were looking for his wisdom. They were actually coming to Jesus trying to trap him. And yet even in the midst of that, through God's grace, Jesus gives this amazing answer that still resonates with us today. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 34, it says this. It says, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Sadducees were Sadducees. They uh, were, were trying to, that's a little Sunday school joke. They were, trying to, uh, they were trying to pinpoint Jesus and trick him with a different question, and yet they couldn't outsmart him. Of course, they didn't know it at the time, but Jesus being the God of the universe, you're not going to outsmart him very well. So it says, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees, another group of religious leaders during the, that time, got together. One of them, an expert in the law tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Again, probably not asked out of the, the clearest heart, the best conscience. Probably asked to try, to try to pinpoint Jesus and get him to answer something wrong. But in verse 37, it says, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and the prophets that hang on these two commandments. What an amazing truth that Jesus gives to us. See, the Pharisees were very familiar with the Old Testament. They were very familiar with all of the different laws that were given during the Old Testament times. In fact, there was about 613 different laws that were given throughout the Old Testament. And so as Jesus was getting asked this question, you have to picture the Pharisees probably picturing, okay, there's 613. There's no way that he's going to be able to pull out one of the, the correct commandments. And you might think that they would be thinking, well, I'm, I'm sure that Jesus is going to say, like, don't murder, right? That's a pretty important law. You know, maybe don't steal. You know, there, there's these 10 commandments that, that we could choose from. And picking those 10 commandments can be really hard. But here's the beauty of Jesus' response and why we should reflect on it today. Jesus says, listen, I'm just going to give you an answer that sums up all those 613 laws into two simple commands. Love God and love people. Love God and love people. And if you're actually doing those two things, you will fulfill all the other laws. Because you can't truly love God and steal from somebody. You can't truly love God and look at your neighbor and want their stuff. You'd be happy for them if you love God, because if you love God, then you're going to love them. What Jesus is showing here is that our vertical relationship with God, you know, we oftentimes as Christians talk about getting away and praying and spending time with God and reading God's word. And that is so important during times like these. And Jesus is saying, as we spend time with God, as we fall more and more in love with God, it will, that vertical relationship flow out into our horizontal relationships. It will inherently affect the way that we love our neighbors. It will inherently affect the relationships that we have with our family members and the people around us. And so if you want to know what the greatest commandments are, start with loving God with everything that you have and watch how that transforms the way that you love your neighbors and everything else will take care of itself. And that's what we seek to do as believers. That's what we seek to do here at H2O. And, and I just have to say, during this crazy season of 2020, I've been so encouraged to watch so many of you live this out. 
I've been so encouraged and so thankful and so honored and so privileged to be able to help be a part of this church. And I don't know, maybe if you're, you're kind of new around here or you're not quite as knit in and don't get to see the, the inner workings of all that goes on, but this year probably more than, than any other year as one of the pastors of this church, I've just been reflecting on, wow, God is working in some awesome ways. And the really cool thing is a lot of times it's been not stuff that we've programmed or, or stuff that we've designed, but just you all living out the greatest commandment. That's what this is called, the greatest commandment, to love God and love people. We've seen many students give up their weekends on Fridays and Saturdays and go out downtown and share the gospel with people. And just look for opportunities to tell people about Jesus. On Halloween, there was about 20 of our students that went out and just lovingly talked to people as they were out searching for something during that time. And many of our people were loving enough to go out and tell people about Jesus. We've seen so many of you say, hey, how can I help and serve? How can I help families that might have specific needs during this pandemic? How can our church rally and be a church that doesn't just huddle together but actually makes an impact on our campus and city? We've seen people be sacrificial in ways that, that we haven't seen before. And, and I've been so humbled to see us live this out. And of course, we're not perfect, right? I always have to throw in that disclaimer. We're, we're not bragging as a church. We're giving glory to God for all that he's done and the way that he's allowed us to see the beauty of serving and loving him. So if we want to know what truly matters in life, we can go to Jesus' words when he was asked, what's the greatest commandment? If you could summarize all of the Old Testament, you know, the Bible, if you could summarize it all, what would you summarize it down to? And here's Jesus' answer. This is what matters. Love God and love people and watch how things fall into place and God starts to work. And I want to encourage us, can we continue doing that? Can we continue as a church to rally behind this call to to find and follow Jesus, to point people towards him and to love God and love people. And then I want to share just one more verse that gives a little more meat into how we can actually do what Jesus is asking us to do to love God and love people. Because in some ways, that just seems like such a simple statement, right? You know, sometimes people overcomplicate Christianity and you look at a verse like this and it's, Jesus says, love God and love people. But then the question is, well, how do we do that? Well, the way that we love people is we tell them about Jesus, because that's the ultimate way that people experience freedom and hope and joy in life so that they can start to then love God and love people. The most loving thing we can do is take the message of the gospel to a world around it that most desperately needs it. That's why we plant churches. That's why we tell people about the Lord. That's why we live our lives in a pattern that will point people towards Jesus. So in Matthew 28, verse 19 through 20, we're about to obey this verse here today, which I'm so excited about. Matthew 28, verse 19 through 20. Before the passage we looked at, Jesus was asked what the most important commandment is. That's a pretty important question. Here, these are some of Jesus' last words before he ascends to heaven, right? And so typically some of the first things you say when you start your ministry and some of the last things you say we should pay a special attention to, right? These are some of Jesus' last words to us in Matthew 28, 19. It says, then Jesus came to them and he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I commanded. And surely I'm with you always until the very end of the age. So Jesus, as he's about to ascend into heaven, says, listen, here is my kind of final commission to you. I want you to know a couple things. First, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. You notice, and I was thinking about this week as I was studying this passage, oftentimes when Jesus sent people out to do ministry, he starts with a phrase similar to that. Hey, listen, all authority is mine. Or I'm going to give you authority as you go. It will be passed on from me to you. And I think that's to give us comfort that as we are uh, given this task of taking the gospel and telling people about the love of Christ, it can feel like a weighty task, can it? Feel like, how in the world could I ever do that? I don't live up to these standards perfectly. I fall short oftentimes. Jesus says, listen, it's not about you. All authority has been given to me, Jesus says. So therefore, Go and make disciples of all the nations. And he says, baptize them. We're going to baptize people today. 
And he says, tell them to teach them to obey my commands. Finding and actually following Jesus. Not just professing a faith in him, but actually following him. And surely I will be with you always unto the very end of the age. You know, as we seek to partner with God, we try to plant churches as we try to share the love of Jesus in the places that we find ourselves in, it's so comforting to know that first, Jesus gives us the authority, and second, he's with us. He's with us in the midst of that, uh, of that commission that he gives to us. Uh, we use this phrase around here sometimes at HO. We say, when we share the gospel or when we tell people about Jesus, it's just like going to work with dad. It's just like, it's just like you know, maybe you've been on, on those days where your parents have like a work day and you get to go along with them. I love to do house projects. And so sometimes my kids, uh, I'll invite them to come and do a project with me. And maybe it'll be something simple like painting or maybe it'll be something like an electrical pro- project or a plumbing project. And, and I'll invite one of my sons or I'll invite my daughter. And as we go, sometimes we'll be working together. And sometimes they'll be excited about coming. Sometimes they won't. It just depends on, you know, what moment of life life they're in and what I'm pulling them away from. And every once in a while at the end when we're working, you know, sometimes there's not that much for them to do, especially when they were younger. They might just be handing me a tool or kind of just being there with me. And they'll say something like, Dad, you didn't even need me to be there. You know, Dad, I didn't really even do anything. And, And my response will always be, yeah, but I just wanted to spend time with you. I didn't invite you to come do that project with me because I needed you. I invited you to come do that project with me because I like being around you. I want to spend time with you. I I want to develop our relationship. So yeah, you're right. I didn't need you, but I wanted you there. I wanted you to be a part of this. And as we're sent out, that's what God is saying to us. Saying, listen, as you go, whether it's going on a church plant, whether it's going to your classes, whether it's going to your job, whether it's going to the Thanksgiving dinner table and talking with your family, whatever the case may be, as you go, know that I'm giving you authority to tell people about my love and to teach them to obey, and I'm right there with you, in relationship with you, doing ministry together, because I love you and I love the people that I brought you into contact with. What an amazing privilege we have as a church to be part of living out the greatest commandment and the great commission to tell the world about Jesus. And so today, we're going to celebrate that together. I'm going to pray here in a minute, and then we have uh, people at all four of our, or all three of our services that are going to be getting baptized today. And so we'll explain that here in just one minute. But let me pray for them as we're heading into that time. Lord, we thank you for the privilege that it is to be partnered with you. How do you say Surely I will be with you always. How comforting is that? Or when we feel intimidated by our inadequacies in life, when we can't imagine being able to be used by you, will we not be afraid of failure at the things that truly matter? But will we rest in the fact that you've given us authority and that you are with us? Lord, thank you for this church. Thank you for these women and men that so selflessly serve and point people towards you. I pray that you help us to continue to grow in our love for you and our love for one another. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.